Thank you, Farhat. It's, uh, it's an honor and a pleasure to be back in India with MSF for your scientific days. Uh, thank you so much for the invitation to be here. And if I could have the slides started. Voila. Okay, here's the upshot. Biological life as we know it on planet Earth is at risk of becoming unrecognizably altered because one species, ours, is destroying Earth's life-giving systems. We've created a climate crisis and nearly every ecosystem on the planet, aquatic and terrestrial, terrestrial, is in jeopardy. Environmental degradation and specifically global heating are the greatest challenges humanity has faced during our roughly 100,000 years of existence. And so my central question to you today is this. Are the pace and extent of MSF's institutional adaptation to the realities of climate change proportionate to the magnitude of this humanitarian crisis? Scientists are united in telling us that we have about 11 years to change our destructive behaviors, to take immediate meaningful actions, specifically that will reduce the amount of carbon dioxide that we pump into the atmosphere by 50% by the year 2030, and then to net zero carbon emissions by the year 2050. If we do that, we'll stabilize global, global temperatures, and Mother Nature as we know her will not collapse. Humanity has a simple choice. We can continue our business as usual level of extraction, consumption, and pollution, or not. If we don't, we know what awaits as temperatures continue to climb. The profound effects of climate on health are well documented. Today, unclean air causes about 7 million deaths annually, according to the World Health Organization. Three times more people today are killed by pollution than by AIDS, tuberculosis, and malaria combined, according to The Lancet. Prolonged drought is one of the most dangerous environmental determinants of premature mortality. Already some 30 countries are currently experiencing downward trends in crop yields and in the value of the nutritional quality of their crops, trends that only get worse as global heating continues. Climate-driven migration is expected to move 2.5 billion people into urban settings in the coming decades, where they are going to face continued environmental, physical, and psychological threats, as well as increased civil conflict and the potential for violence. The title of MSF's recent Lancet Countdown Report on Climate and Health, published late last year, says it best. This is an urgent new frontier for humanitarians. We're in unprecedented territory. And what is humanitarian space in the context of a climate crisis? Is it business as usual? Do you simply refine your surveillance? adapt your emergency preparedness, take a wait and see reactive stance before negotiating access to provide assistance to populations in distress? What if the risk to life as we know it provokes in humanitarians a desire to take a more proactive solutions oriented stance vis-a-vis -vis the climate crisis? Then how, if at all, does your charter constrain or enable you to do so? How enabling or how detrimental Will your independence, impartiality, and neutrality be in the race against a faceless, nationless, yet man-made humanitarian crisis that worsens as we dismantle the planet's life-giving systems? Dr. James Urbinski, a friend and mentor to a lot of us, he said in his acceptance speech on behalf of MSF for the Nobel Prize in 1999, he said, and I quote, humanitarianism is not a tool to end war or to create peace. It is a citizen's response to political failure. It is an immediate short-term act that cannot erase the long-term necessity of political responsibility." End quote. Of course, I agree with that, but I'm also afraid that we don't have the luxury of a long-term on which to wait for politics to get this right. We have mere decades. So what is the scope of the citizen's response 
How far does it need to go when government's responsibility is so tardy and anemic? Few agencies are perhaps more familiar than MSF is with the consequences of the political failure to halt genocide, conflict, and pandemic. Last year, the United Nations Climate Change Conference, the COP24, was unsparingly political and produced few outcomes proportionate to the climate crisis at hand. Perhaps this is no great surprise to people whose worldview has been informed deeply by the time we've spent serving MSF missions. James Urbinski goes on to say in the same speech, humanitarians' action and our voice is an act of indignation, a refusal to accept an active or passive assault on the other. But where is the source of this assault and who is the other? Where the health of the planet is concerned and where the climate crisis is concerned, we are all in this one boat together. There are no insiders and there are no outsiders. Today, I believe leaders across MSF's operational centers, partner sections, your national and international boards are absolutely justified in building MSF into an entity that can play a significant role, not only in responding medically to the worst humanitarian impacts of the climate crisis, but also in helping to halt it. And let's face it, from the Americas across Africa, South Asia to the Middle East, MSF's investment in the humanitarian impacts of the climate crisis are already enormous. So the first step in building MSF's institutional adaptation is a low hanging fruit. Boldly and clearly narrate your humanitarian missions for exactly what they are, what they have been and what they will be. Responses to the humanitarian fallout of a climate crisis that must be stopped. And this is a new strategic positioning strongly and I think wisely articulated in this recent MSF paper published by leaders at the Manson unit. Like many of you, during my career I've seen firsthand how humanity's utter neglect of concern for the planet has decimated societies, economies, and lives. Before joining Health and Harmony two years ago, I spent about 15 years involved with humanitarian and post-conflict response work in Africa, South Asia, and the former Yugoslavia. These are three of the last humanitarian crises I was involved with before departing MSF two years ago, one in the Middle East and two in Africa. Now think for a second, what do they have in common? Of course, you all know the answer to this. The direct and indirect root causes of each one of these crises includes environmental degradation, global heating, and climate change. As an MSFer, I felt like I was getting up every day going to work dealing with the fallout of a sick planet, which is precisely what I was doing. Our planet is the patient now and its vital signs aren't good. So whether we're in the corporate, academic, public, humanitarian, or development sector, I believe the most vital work that we can be doing today, indeed the work I, th I think that we must be doing, is work that ensures all species have a planet that we can inhabit. This is what our Health and Harmony team is doing. We're a planetary health organization. Our programs deconstruct the false boundaries between human well-being and development and the health of ecosystems. Our mission is to reverse deforestation of tropical rainforests in order to mitigate carbon dioxide emissions and, and curb global warming. You could hear chainsaws all the time, illegally logging in the national park. And now, you can't hear them anywhere. The reason is, we did something crazy. So we actually listened. They told us that what they would need would be access to high quality, affordable health care, so they wouldn't have to log to pay for health care, and they needed training in sustainable agriculture, particularly in organic farming. So that's what we did. We had an 88% drop in logging households, and we've had a drop in under five mortality. The environment is healthier and the humans are healthier and happier. We are so excited about replicating this model. 
there are many other places that we would like to work. So let's work together and make it possible. We focus on tropical rainforests because the simplest, most effective, and least expensive way to stop global heating in the, in the next 11 years is to protect and expand the Earth's forests. By some estimates, the world's rainforests absorb about a third of the carbon dioxide that humans spew into the atmosphere every year. They are the remarkably proficient lungs of this planet. Our film introduced you to our first program, now about 12 years old, in uh, Indonesian Borneo at a 250,000 acre national park called Gunung Palung National Park, which 15 years ago, like the rest of Borneo, was experiencing a massive loss of rainforest coverage due to illegal logging. Now when it comes to reversing deforestation, the root causes are multifaceted and complex. So we depend expressly on the wisdom of the people who live in these forests to know best how to protect them. Local and, and indigenous communities are the experts, not us. So we enter rainforest communities and we pr practice what we call radical listening. We start by asking people a very simple question. We say, you are the guardians of this precious rainforest that is valuable to the whole planet. How might the world community assist you to live in balance with this rainforest as a way of thanking you for your guardianship of it? We learned from the approximately 100,000 people living around Gunung Paling National Park that they had almost no other economic opportunities other than to log and sell rainforest trees. And the critical driver was to be able to afford their health care, was to be able to afford medical emergencies and transport to, to health centers. The connection between human health and ecosystem integrity was that direct. And it's a reality we see in rainforests from Brazil to Madagascar, Indonesia, and the Philippines. These Indonesian communities concluded that they could stop logging in the rainforest if they had access to affordable quality health care and access to training and alternative livelihoods, particularly organic farming. So that's what we did. In 2007, we began investing precisely in their locally designed solution, in their holistic approach. We established a medical center staffed by Indonesians and it initiated trainings in organic farming facilitated by expert farmers from the neighboring island of Java. And they were right. Their solution is working remarkably well. Since 2007, hundreds of former loggers are now farmers or small business owners and illegal logging in Gunung Palung National Park has dropped by 88%. Infant mortality has dropped over 60%. Logging of primary rainforest has completely stopped, which means habitat for about 2,500 critically endangered Bornean orangutans, or about 10% of the world's remaining population of this species, has been protected. Costs of health care at our medical clinic are tiered based on each village's commitment to reduce and stop logging. And to ensure that everyone has access to health care, people can pay for their care with non-cash payments, such as rainforest tree seedlings and manure, which we then use in our reforestation program. Last year alone, 17,000 seedlings were used by patients as payment for thousands of US dollars worth of medical care. And significantly, since 2007, 50,000 acres of secondary forests have regrown. Now, to put this in perspective, if Gunung Palung National Park were logged and burnt, which is business as usual, and which likely would have happened without our work, the amount of carbon dioxide released into the Earth's atmosphere would be equivalent to the amount of carbon dioxide released during 14 years worth of emissions from the city of San Francisco. Thanks to their work in Borneo, this lung of the planet is healing helping clean the air and stabilize global temperatures. In collaboration with Stanford University, we seek to publish these results in a peer-reviewed scientific journal later this year. And this will support Health and Harmony's position in the emerging carbon economy as a carbon offset partner of choice 
for corporations and for nonprofits like MSF. To say nothing of the monetary value of the biological diversity our interventions are protecting and the cost savings resulting from healthier rainforest communities. On the shoulders of our success in Borneo, we're now attempting to scale our impact across other tropical rainforests. Last year, we opened a second pro project site at another massive rainforest in Borneo. And today, as I speak, we have a team in Brazil conducting, conducting an explo, conducting a feasibility assessment in the Amazon. And another team just returned last week from Madagascar where they finalized agreements that we need to become operational there later this year. We want to know if our unique way of investing in rainforest communities can bring as much value in Brazil and Madagascar as it did at our proof of concept site in Borneo. If it does, then we'll attempt to scale our impact through an online platform which connects the locally designed solutions of these rainforest communities to global citizens who are desperate to support the protection of these rainforests. And the platform will use artificial intelligence to measure carbon gains and losses in real time. I say we're planetary health in action. Why is that? <clears throat> it's because our unique approach improves both human health and the health of the rainforest ecosystem on which our human health depends. Our health and harmony doctors, nurses, and midwives are well aware of the health code benefits of their program's conservation outcomes. They know their patients' asthma, tuberculosis, dengue, malaria, and nutrition status are mirror reflections of the integrity of the local rainforest ecosystem. And they discuss this with their patients during consultations. Because human behavior drives the feedback between ecosystem destruction and poor health, healthcare workers globally, including MSFs, have a responsibility and a great opportunity to be planetary healers. And to MSF's credit, a collaboration between Operational Center Geneva and MSF Canada and others has started to introduce and integrate the concepts and practices and practices of this new discipline of planetary health into MSF's medical operations. This environmental toolkit and a strategic planetary health pillar are just two of the important and influential outputs of this group's work. In closing, I would like to propose to MSF to consider immediately taking these four actions. First, the time is now for MSF's leadership across operational centers, partner sections, national and at the international board to make space for answering this question. Is the pace and extent of MSF's institutional adaptation to the realities of climate change proportionate to the magnitude of this humanitarian crisis? Arguably, MSF risks making itself operationally and culturally irrelevant in the next decade if it doesn't adequately adapt itself. Operationally, your humanitarian responses will not be as effective as they could be. Culturally, the generations of people worldwide who did not grow up during the Cold War, the hundreds of millions for whom climate is the cultural point of departure and central preoccupation, they will not understand you, will not resonate with your institution's unique value, and your business model could dry up. Today, I understand that the strategic, the strategic plans of all MSF operational centers engage climate change. And you have just passed a very important climate emergency motion at the International General Assembly, sponsored by three operational centers and several partner sections while another motion on environmental action has been passed at Operational Center Paris. You have momentum. These are critical steps in the right direction. Now MSF needs to give these words teeth. You've got to turn these words into meaningful action. Second, follow the lead of this critical Manson unit recommendation and boldly communicate your humanitarian responses as exactly what they are, responses to the humanitarian consequences of the worsening climate crisis. That's a low-hanging fruit. My third call to action, radically listen to your movement and to your leaders who live within the communities who are and will be most affected by climate change and invest in their locally designed humanitarian responses to the climate crisis. 
These maps show an interesting perspective that I bet you've seen. The top map shows nations in proportion to their responsibility for causing global heating, and the bottom map shows nations in proportion to the vulnerability of the negative impacts of climate heating. Broadly speaking, the people on top are causing it, the people living in countries on bottom are suffering it. These maps may contain two important insights to guide MSF's adaptation in the short term. The bottom map shows where the greatest volume of MSF's humanitarian operations will be needed to save lives and alleviate suffering as a result of the climate crisis. And the bottom map also shows you where MSF is going to find the people with the most pertinent, the most innovative designs for MSF's humanitarian interventions in these contexts. Communities in Central and South America, South Asia and Africa, they are on the front lines of humanitarian crises daily. Uh, sorry, on the fallout of the, of, the, of the climate crisis daily. So they're best placed to guide humanitarian interventions to the fallout. Fourth and finally, become a carbon neutral organization as rapidly as possible and this shouldn't take you long. Like all nonprofits, MSF currently keeps a small percentage of most donations and grants to pay for the support costs of conducting your global humanitarian operations. The majority of your, the majority of your 21st century donors will not only understand, but will wholeheartedly support an additional tiny percentage of their gifts being used to offset carbon, the carbon footprint of your humanitarian operations. Health and Harmony and others like us are partners of choice for corporate and nonprofit, for, for corporations and for nonprofits like MSF, who are ready to offset your carbon dioxide emissions. Your new environmental toolkit gives the entire MSF movement the starting point you need to audit, reduce, and offset your emissions. The current trajectory of our planet's health is an emergency. The patient is on the gurney and we have to act fast. And I don't just mean in terms of acting now to improve your preparedness and the quality of your response to the health consequences of climate change and environmental degradation. My desire, if I may speak plainly, is for MSF to use your credibility, your influence and your voice to do more to prevent and stop global heating in the next decade. I'm probably not alone in wanting to see a meaningful proportion of MSF's 40,000 staff, a, meaning, a meaningful proportion of your thousands of global associative members, and a meaningful proportion of your financial resources dedicated to solving the climate crisis. Now trust me, I understand your eye rolling. I was part of MSF's operations and executive long enough to develop the slight weariness to the constant suggestions that MSF can do more of this, MSF must do more of that. I get it, the weariness of being asked to be everything for everyone all the time. But now I'm on the outside, so aware of how strong is the action, influence, and empathy of your movement. And I'm asking you to ask yourselves in the face of what is arguably the greatest humanitarian crisis our species will face on planet Earth, is MSF doing enough? Thank you very much. And I just want to say a special thanks to Farhat and Encore for having me back to India. It's been a real pr privilege to be here with you. Thank you.